talking about. The story is true. true. You should go fast. Just in case you stumble upon this on YouTube or BitChute or Mega, where this is available, uh, you can, of course, uh, download and share this for free. This is a Creative, Cro Creative Commons broadcast uh, with hopefully enough media uh, to kind of keep you occupied uh, during the cold winter, or in the case as today, maybe the hot summer, somewhere else in the world. Uh, we have all kinds of media hopefully for you. Generally, this week I haven't got as much of the media for you, though I did remember to play the background music. Hopefully the background music comes through okay. And as usual, I've got uh, two Creative Commons-ish pieces to play, so let's get right in them. They're both kind of short, so I decided to pull two out of my kind of hat today. Uh, hopefully that works okay. So I'll give them a spin. Here we go. Welcome to real life. So it's so to make it and sad, but so Welcome to real life.
That was Boomstick uh, by Yuster, uh, which is one of the 8-bit people's uh, label uh, artists. Uh, there used to be, at one point, a torrent with all of 8-bit people's artists on it, uh, available via Creative Commons. That was a very cool thing for them to do. I would have definitely never heard of Yupster without that. Um, it's all 8-bit uh, music, so anything that uh, could have been created or played uh, or, or, or at least in some way related to the hardware of the age of 8-bit computers, so stuff like the original Nintendo Entertainment System, which is kind of what I grew up with, uh, as well as the old, old uh, computers, um, many of which I did not, uh, kind of most of the, the, the computer side of things, I guess I would have probably experienced was 16 to 32 bit. Uh, this would have been a little bit before that. Uh, so Yupster, uh, I don't know exactly how they create their music, but I know, I know some of the other 8-bit people's artists have done stuff like actually taken Game Boys and taken Nintendos and kind of reverse engineered them enough to make musical instruments out of them. Again, I, I don't know how Yupster specifically does it. Uh, certainly they do something along those lines, uh, or at least something to create that sort of Nintendo beep boop sound that, uh, I don't know, just kind of resonates with me personally. Uh, but uh, this this is kind of that kind of music that that label produces. And then of course, Porn on Beta, probably the most racy thing I've played so far. Uh, that is the first track of their album, uh, I believe, Welcome to Real Life. Um, and I believe the track is titled the same as the album. So that is kind of the, the concept album in, in, in one track form. Uh, so let's get this kind of background music playing. I've been meaning to get this black background music uh, going for quite a while. Uh, there we go. Nice, relaxing, Creative Commons piano music, maybe at a reasonable level. Anyway, so uh, as usual, uh, this, this has been slightly less of a crazy week uh, for me personally, uh, as some of the previous weeks, um, I was able to actually get some things uh, kind of done in my life, which was kind of nice. Uh, I did get to visit and meet with a couple of people. Uh, so I've, I've got kind of a little bit more idea of what's going on in the world uh, than perhaps the last two shows. And so the first thing I kind of want to talk about, and it's too bad, uh, every week, by the way, I have invited people to join, uh, not just as someone watching passively and maybe listening to this as a podcast, which is kind of how I prefer to be, you know, listened to, uh, but to actually participate and to uh, show a glimpse of their life too. So it's not just something purely of me and my life and my world. This has been uh, every single week an attempt to reach out to other people. Uh, so far, that hasn't been a very successful uh, uh, thing, uh, but it's something I intend to keep doing. And I intend to keep not just the spirit of Rent Radio alive, as I kind of mentioned on the, the first episode, uh, which is still available on YouTube and Mega and so on, uh, but I would actually like to bring other people into this and to have more of a dialogue going on. Uh, so if you do get one of these invites, maybe think about it. Uh, obviously, the time and the date doesn't work for everyone, but who knows? Maybe someone uh, will, will notice it. Facebook doesn't do a very good job of uh, passing the notifications on, uh, but it is what it is. So, the, But why I wanted to bring that up is because uh, something kind of came up this week, uh, which is that there was... Um, Someone kind of described to me uh, a problem where, and I've heard this described in other places, uh, where the idea is that debate is pointless. And I, I first heard this when uh, I was kind of reading uh, about the, from the perspective of uh, scientists like Richard Dawkins um, and biologists who were at the time uh, considering or, or going through the process of having kind of big debates with creationists. And the biologists were trying to make the ar argument that to even debate creationists is to give them a kind of legitimacy that they should not have. And that the ideas of 
uh, evolution as the origin of our species are set in stone enough uh, in the world of science and observation that we don't even have to bother with that. And so if people happen to be creationists, we should just sort of let them continue to be, keep doing good science and so on. And I mean, there, there is something to be said for that, especially in narrow, more narrow fields like evolutionary biology or specific parts of evolutionary biology, like the evolution of the eye or the evolution of hair or what, you know, pick your specialty. Uh, and so I can understand why, especially people who go through the effort of uh, getting a, a master's degree in some topic, any topic really, where they dedicate that much of their life to a topic that they really do become an expert in it. And so being challenged on that can certainly seem insulting, right? Uh, where people who don't really know any better, uh, who think they know better, uh, can you know get to the point where they can call you to task in a public sphere. Uh, that that's a, that's an, uh, a hard thing to have to put up with. I'm sure. Like I, I don't have the master's degree myself, but I, it, it, it's a lot to ask of someone to take a. a Part of their day, whether for free or or paid or whatever, just to to waste enough time to deal with ignorant people. Unfortunately, though, uh, the more broader the topic gets, the less compelling that argument becomes. And so, I've heard the same argument not just in terms of creationists, but in terms of religion in general. And so, for example, Christopher Hitchens would go to. Uh, churches and synagogues and mosques and and do the the debate uh, in person and you can go watch them they're they're great debates some of them and there there are criticisms of that kind of a, a debate arrangement uh, so for example it is easy to get cheap shots in every once in a while and Hitchens that definitely doesn't hold those cheap shots back uh, it's it's amusing from the perspective of someone who agrees with them. Uh, but at the same time, it kind of cheapens the debate. Now, in the case of Hitchens, personally, I think that he does more than just cheap shots. Um, agree or disagree with him or the people he's arguing with, uh, but at least both sides honestly brought something to the table in those early debates in the earlier part of this century. And those uh, are probably the, some of the best examples. Uh, but it's, it's not just organized political debates that this is kind of a, applies to. Um, even silly Facebook threads, uh, Facebook, it's a really hard place to argue because your one side or the other tends to get censored very quickly. And so you can only see little bits and pieces of the conversation. Uh, something I kind of call when a conversation gets like that, I call it a parlo phantom where you, you're seeing kind of like the ghost of a conversation. Um, so Facebook isn't a great place to have conversations where people disagree, but at the same point, time, it's also kind of the only place where a lot of people who wouldn't normally communicate interact. And so there is that to consider. The main argument, though, that was kind of brought up, though, this week is that the internet has given us all kinds of access to information that we would not otherwise have. And we have had this information for long enough that if you cared to be informed on a subject, you probably could have by now been informed about that subject. And that it's really, uh, there's no excuse to debate anyone ever because the information to resolve that debate is is there. So it's, it's on the fault of one of the sides of the argument, whichever side that you may want to believe uh, is wrong, uh, to, to actually go educate themselves in a matter that doesn't involve another human being kind of uh, holding your hand and walking you through the argument and evidence that supports their worldview. Now, the problems, th there are problems with this. Uh, a particular argument in that one, there is actually a, a lack of information I'm finding, uh, or at least a lack of good, uh, valid information. We've lost a lot of sources of information over the past couple of years that would have been there otherwise. Things like the US government going through and just burning <laughs> all their climate change data when the Trump administration was elected. That's one example. Now, there are other sources of, of climate information in the world left that you don't have to go and collect the actual uh, tree samples and ice cores yourself. You can actually still go to your, if you have a local library, uh, go to the library, ask the librarians about climate science. They'll probably point you in something of the right direction. However, there's also a lot of misdirection and 
competing worldviews on even just that topic. So is it impossible that if you went to a library and you asked that they might direct you to the, the Heritage Institute rather than the, the UN's IPCC? Uh, it is plausible you could be directed to either, and then depending which one you were directed to first might really inform how you view evidence as you collect it afterwards. And then at that point, is it worth completely ignoring all argument and evidence after or, or presented to you by other human beings uh, because they should assume or should be assumed to have seen the evidence that you've seen. Climate science alone is a complicated topic. I've gone through the IPCC AR4 report. It is quite long and it took me many years to do it. Uh, now granted it wasn't my sole focus, but at this end there are people who whose job it is and whose obsession it is to become more educated about that particular topic. But at the same time, it is important that we not necessarily give up our ability to know things outside of what experts tell us. So for example, in the case of climate science, one of the good things about it is that there are computer models that are available that are part of the evidence for what is happening and could happen with our climate. And it is plausible that more people could be brought to observe those climate models. It's just something that's not currently done. Is, is it something that we could be bringing into the schools in a different way? One of the, the people that I know who's kind of skeptical about the, the arrangements involving climate science right now suggests that we bring students as part of the curriculums, uh, as part of their, their school system, to a broader and better understanding of the statistics, computer models, and the underlying understanding of how climate science works so that whether or not you accept the claims of the experts at least coming out of the school system you'll have a better appreciation for the statistics involved that's probably a good idea but to avoid debate and to postpone and give the credibility purely to experts i think it it, it goes a little bit too far and it goes too far because we have to be able to understand and evaluate not just who the experts are and which ones we should believe, but also in, in a sense of how well they're doing and how well they know their, their stuff on a higher and higher level. And right now, there is kind of a transition going on, I think, in the, the longer term, where you have education systems, governments, uh, that have historically had control over the flows of information that may or may not continue to do so as time goes on free software like projects uh, and open more open to the public projects would do a good deal uh, to help people understand uh, large complicated scientific problems if everyone as part of their life did more participatory science uh, projects they may understand a little bit more of not just the outcomes of the that particular science but the difficulty involved and this is hard stuff this isn't an, an easy problem to solve there are going to be people who are just not going to believe in evolution. And this this may continue for quite some time. But it, it's not something that we have to give up on, I think. And so I'd definitely be interested in hearing kind of more perspectives on this. But that's that's kind of the point, is we, we should always be interested in hearing more perspectives. Even the ones that challenge the experts that we take for granted are totally and utterly legitimate. Because we could be wrong. And there's ways we can be wrong that make it possible for us to not see that maybe we're right about some aspect about it, but we're missing a bigger picture. And so, and, and, and this is something I've kind of seen over and over and over this week, where people who I, I agree with on, on a, a really broad level uh, seem to just be missing some something that other people that I know are seeing. And so, and so like the two sides, the left and the right, are, are kind of seeing something about how the other acts or behaves and are reacting to that. And it, it's kind of getting into a bit of a tangle. And especially when we stop talking to each other, we stop and we give up the idea that the other side can be persuaded or, or is reasonable and rational at all, then we become a little bit less reasonable and rational ourselves. The argument was kind of made that in the past maybe decade or so, going back to the Obama years in the States especially, the Republicans stopped cooperating with the Democrats on a, a large variety of areas that they had normally cooperated with. So it wasn't so much that they disagreed with the particular policies of the Obama administration as that much as they wanted it to seem like he was incompetent and incapable of governing. And so they made themselves incapable of governing by 
of resisting on basically all levels. And it's taken until a pretty close to now for the Democrats to pick up this kind of um, the approach to policy, uh, a kind of scorched earth, refusing to budge, refusing to compromise, refusing to engage level, which, but they have gotten there. And so they, it's, it's not just in the level of government, it's, it's at the level, it's starting to go down to the level of individual people. And that's something I think is kind of uh, a scary thing when people stop being willing to cooperate uh, even on areas of uh, mutual understanding and agreement. And where, where does it go from there? Does it have to get to the point where people start throwing bricks at each other, for example? Uh, does it have to get to the point where people cut, cut other people out of their lives just for disagreeing on some minutiae argument? If we're not used to people in our lives disagreeing with us, we, and we will, when we encounter someone disagreeing with us, uh, be more uh, or less resistant to that happening. Uh, so if you've surrounded yourself with people who agree with you politically, if there's some issue within that group that just happens to be something that isn't covered by the orthodoxy and the dogma that you believe, and, and the experts are split on it, the group can split. The group can be weaker uh, because it's not as coordinated when this happens. But it's it's also some a matter of like, we, we're just missing this, this level of mutual human understanding. So I think we can value uh, verifiable information at a high level, high enough to make it so that we challenge whether or not debate is necessary. I think we can we can make it so that the availability of information is a alternative to debates, and we can put effort towards that. But I think that it is still important to have the space where debates happen, and even within our all of our lives, it doesn't have to be a formal debate. It can just be. Something where you disagree with family, maybe you disagree with friend, maybe it's somebody you just meet on the, the street or in the, the supermarket or something like that. It's, it's good to have different perspectives around you to inform you what is kind of going on in the world because you could be wrong. And so that is kind of one of the things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the, the next thing, uh, this one is kind of a newer thing, uh, happened, when, when was this? Oh, I guess it's happened one month ago, but it's updated on the 17th. So this is from the mtlblog.com or Montreal blog, I guess, from its Canada section. Canadians can now be fined up to $5,000 for illegally downloading TV shows and movies. Ignorance will not be bliss in this case. Uh, quote, gone are the days when we were safe up here with our download warnings. Apparently, according to the CBC, we'll open that, uh, Canadians now run the risk of actually being fined for torrenting or otherwise illegally download, downloading copyrighted content like TV shows and movies. The CBC spoke with Nova Scotia lawyer who explained to Canadians who received the piece of registered mail from a movie studio should take it seriously as ignoring it could result in further legal action. Um, the lawyer above explains that if you ignore the notice sent to your house, you can end up with a quote default judgment, a maximum of which is a $5,000 fine. If continuously ignore, I think they mean continuously ignored, that could turn into a lien on your house or garnishment on your salary. The Copyright Modernization Act allows internet service providers to keep track of the IP addresses of users who have been flagged as illegally downloading copyrighted content. Studios have taken the next step oh, hold on, and are using the IP address to sue the unknown person associated with the address. They get a, quote, Norwich order through the Federal Court of Canada, unquote, which allows them to obtain the customer's name and address. While the letters may look like something you could ignore, pause. And the reason why they're so repeating this part about um, you could ignore, uh, don't ignore these particular uh, responses or, or these particular letters and, you know, don't, don't ignore um, is because up until recently, uh, the safest thing that you could do when you got one of these kinds of notices is to actually ignore it. Uh, under Canadian law, under the uh, Copyright Modernization Act, it was mandatory that internet service providers like SaskTel or Bell or uh, TVTel or TELUS or whatever um, would have to tell, basically send you a letter if they were notified by a third party that that third party's copyright was violated by you. They wouldn't have to tell that third party who you were, uh, and in fact, were prohibited from doing so due to privacy legislation. Um, but they had to pass that information on. And I guess they had to also keep track of who got these letters, or at least they have been keeping track of who got these letters. Uh, and 
they had, I guess, have been reporting the IP address. Now, even so, if you get one of these letters, it, it's worth reading it, at the very least. The difference being is one, these ones are registered mail. So if you get a registered piece of mail, uh, apparently you have to sign for it. And so you have to basically verify that you are the person who it, the, the letter is being directed to. And then the other kind of difference is that the, the I guess the, the way that it is written it is written assuming that the the there there's kind of this a default judgment available. Now uh, up until recently there there has been a requirement for a trial uh, for this to have, the five thousand dollar penalty to actually be enacted, and most of the companies involved aren't willing to actually go through that trial. Uh, they were willing to threaten and they were making a good deal of money by just threatening a lot of people because a lot of people didn't know that you could just ignore these notices and nothing would come of it and so they've been pocketing thousands tens of thousands maybe hundreds of thousands possibly millions of dollars by just this kind of extortion racket even though according to the law they were in order to collect the the, the big five thousand dollars they would have had to have actually gone to court now so back to the article studios have taken the next step oh here we go uh, if you don't file a defense within 30 days you will end up with a quote default judgment mentioned above if you've been relying on sites like BitTorrent, uTorrent, the pirate bay or others to get your game of thrones fix you may want to consider an alternative route from here on out and that's originally from the cbc now right off the top so the most important thing in response to this uh, particular story that you can do is if you are already using something like QTorrent, BitTorrent, um, Vuz, uh, any of the BitTorrent clients that are not Tribbler, you should be switching to Tribbler or trying to get Tribbler up and running uh, if it is not currently up and running. Unfortunately, tri uh, Tribbler is broken for me personally, uh, not due to any problem with the Tribbler code, but due to one of its dependencies. Uh, one of the libraries is just not currently working for my particular computer. Now, I'm assuming that other people have been able to get Tribbler to work. Maybe this is not the case. If you're having trouble with Tribbler, maybe that's that's something I might be interested in knowing about. But the point, why bring up Tribbler, is because this kind of legal threat will only work if they know who you are and they can find your IP address that you're downloading from, which BitTorrent gives that third party. And if you use Tribbler, Tribbler it works as a uh, network by shielding everyone involved to, from seeing what data is being transmitted by who uh, using crypto. And so if you use Tribbler, you will be safe, at least from the time being, from these kinds of attacks, uh, these kinds of legal attacks. Uh, however, the, the other thing that they don't talk about in this article is how this impacts streaming. Because streaming is kind of, it should at least be, between the streaming site that you go to, uh, just a normal website with a video on it, and your internet connection. And the third parties in between you can, of course, see what you're streaming. But the, the people sending these particular notices don't necessarily have access to those third parties in between you and the streaming site. So is it possible that you could get a takedown notice from going to a, a streaming site? It's absolutely technically possible. However, there's nothing in here that suggests that tr uh, streaming sites and people who use them will get these letters. Now, use an internet service provider like Bell, who also happens to be a vertically integrated media monopoly. If you do, then they have every incentive to watch and monitor what you download and what you stream, uh, so that if you are downloading and watching, let's say, Game of Thrones tonight, the last uh, episode, then it's entirely plausible that Bell could see, and Bell has every interest in, and catching you doing that so that they have the interest, they have the technology, logically it's capable that they could do it and they, they can legally do it. All these things together. Other internet service providers might have a little bit of a more difficult time, but still it's to the point where in Canada, you really should be using Tribbler if you're downloading media that uh, is of questionable content online.
Now, you should be using Tribbler for the non-questionable content too, to make sure that when people start to think about using Tribbler in a serious way, that it's, it's kind of like the Betamax uh, or, or the, the VHS tape. Lots of people pirated media on VHS. I, there's, there's, I grew up with taped TV shows. That was just what we did back in the day when TV was a, a, a broadcast medium where a show only happened at a certain time and a certain day. And if you couldn't be there, you could record it so that you could watch it later. That was something that even the U.S. Supreme Court said was okay. Time shifting is an okay thing for consumers to do. Likewise, being able to download privately without having your, the, the government see everything that you, you watch might be something that people should be expecting out of their, their internet connection. So there's, uh, let's, there's another link here. Okay, so the Twitter feed in question, the lawyer in, in specific who was kind of talking about this is one David T.S. Fraser at Privacy Lawyer. And he's saying a, quote, torrent of lawsuits are descending on Canadians, unquote. So one, yes, kind of funny pun, haha. But the, uh, this isn't just one or two people then. This is, this is a good couple of people. They don't have any hard numbers, so we can't know exactly how many people are being targeted by this. But if it goes anything like they had in the States, they can scale this up quite, quite quickly to the point where hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people get these notices. Don't think that they wouldn't do that. They've done it in the past. This is what they're capable of doing. And sure, they don't have to even have any legal grounding to be able to do it. If everyone just allows them to have a default judgment, they'll get $5,000 from everyone who ignores their letter. And that's probably what they're betting on. They're betting on that people are gonna treat these letters like the previous ones. And who knows, maybe this has been the plan the whole time to set up kind of this expectation that you can ignore these kinds of letters and then send a bunch of these 5,000 letters and at $5,000 a pop, that's some pretty good cash. Like, hey, I'd be okay with $5,000 just landing in my po you know, pocket from you know 20,000 or 100,000 people. Sure, why not? But uh, so the questions coming up, so this is probably questions people are gonna ask often. Uh, why would a Canadian have to respond if it's an American company? Privacy lawyer says because it's a lawsuit uh, filed in the Canadian court alleging violation of the Canadian Copyright Act, which is true. The way that Canadian copyright is set up is to allow American media monopolies to sue Canadians. It, it is part of the law. And then the next question is, uh, if a, a person isn't an IP address and you'd have a hell of a time proving one specific person was behind the IP address at the time. And so there, the response is, quote, yes, that's something they'll have to prove. They're also arguing that the customer associated with the internet account is responsible for everything that happens on that account, but that's not established in Canadian law. And that is an important point. Some people, especially people who have family or friends who work at internet service providers like Bell, where vertically integrated monopolies and have every reason to promote this kind of idea, tend to put forward this idea that if you are the person who pays for the internet account, you're responsible for what happens. This is, as he says, not quite as established as they may want you to believe. It's the kind of thing that they did in the Soviet Union when they made every typewriter uh, require that the, the person who owned the typewriter could be kind of held account for what was printed and typed on it. That's the kind of thing that they're talking about. Thankfully, we may or may not be close to losing that here, but uh, it, it's at least a place where that battle can be fought. And so if you find yourself getting one of these letters, you can represent yourself and defend uh, yourself in court against the claim. Uh, there's a quote, a federal court in every major city in Canada. However, he says elsewhere in this thread, and I'm not seeing it at the current moment, is that you cannot get someone else to defend you who is not a lawyer. This is another one of the situations similar to the parking ticket that I got a couple of weeks ago, where the way the government is kind of <laughs> set up is that you have to be a lawyer to defend other people in court, which really sucks for the people who need defending because one, lawyers are expensive. Two, uh, lawyers may not be following the, the current up-to-date status of things like tech law uh, and law relating to what you can and cannot do with a computer. Uh, so they may just you know offer you to settle as a way of kind of getting small minor lawsuits out of the way, something like that, who knows. But the third most important thing is that it, it's just a lot of hassle to, to get a lawyer to go to this court to defend yourself. And a lot of people are not going to be willing to, to endure that kind of hassle. And it's going to cost the people defending themselves something in lawyer time to stop that kind of an attack from happening. 
And so a lot of people are going to not do it. It would make a lot more sense if for these kinds of cases, for there to be people who are experts in uh, just dealing with this kind of a case available for people to defend against them. Like it, this, this kind of case, if it's scaled up, like right now, if it's only a, a handful of people, it's, it's, it probably makes more sense to have lawyers doing it. But if they sue like 100,000 people, that's more than enough for like a, a couple of dozen people to become really well uh, educated about the particulars of this kind of legal case. Mass cases like this have happened. And so people like Michael Geist, I mean, Michael Geist is a lawyer, but if it wasn't Michael Geist, it could be someone else. Cory Doctorow was not a lawyer. Uh, he'd probably be able to do a pretty good job of defending someone in, in a case, as long as it was a simple case of, did you watch Game of Thrones or not? And could you prove it? Can you prove that this IP address is a human being? If they can't, then there's nothing they can do, right? So the other thing is, lots of links, lots of links open. So, okay, there's one particular law partnership or group or whatever that is jumped on this right away. And that's the McKinnis. Uh, Cooper. Uh, so, quote, if you receive uh, this kind of notice, this statement of claim, McKinnis Cooper represents a number of defendants in these, uh, quote, reverse class action lawsuits, which is what they're calling them, to settle them or to dispute the alleged copyright infringement. The availability of electronic filing are connections with law firms in or initiating these lawsuits and are relatively low cost of legal services in Atlantic Canada puts McKinnis Cooper in a unique position to help Canadians across the country so this isn't just Atlantic Canada, uh, defend themselves against copyright infringement class action lawsuits. For more information, contact them, blah, blah, blah. But we are currently aware that these production studios have started reverse class action lawsuits. Now, this is the, the key point here worth kind of emphasizing here. So the, this is the list. Venice PI, Limited Liability Corporation, Morgan Creek Productions, Dallas Buyers Club, Justice Everywhere Productions, Limited Liability Corporation, Criminal Productions, Bodyguard Productions, ME2 Productions, UN4 Productions, LHF Productions, WWE Studio Finance Corp. Is that like the World Wrestling Federation or whatever they've turned into? Is that is that them? Um, Voltage Pictures et al. Headhunter, Cell Film Holdings, Wind River Productions, POW Nevada, and Hybrid. So all of these companies are companies that have started this, this kind of trend of mass lawsuits in Canada. And the other thing that I, I've kind of lost the, the link for here is that this is still all dependent on all of all of these quick cases are dependent on a single case that is still winding its way through and will probably eventually hit the Supreme Court of Canada involving uh, voltage pictures, basically doing what they're doing, uh, suing customers for downloading and watching their movies. And so far that case has not resolved. And so if they lose that case, all of these possibly hundreds of thousands of cases, because it could get to that point, will collapse on them. So it, that one particular case will be an interesting case to watch. But in the meanwhile, find these companies, find where they're located, like find who are involved with them. Because at the end of the day, these are, all of these are going to be central points of failure. And if they are going to extort people for $5,000 a pop on mass, whether or not people actually download their media, after all, you can send a, one of these warning notices to someone who's already gotten a warning notice uh, with very little recourse. It's it's an extortion scam going on. And so there is certainly, a, it's, it's possible to, to find and target these, these companies and these groups, boycott them, publicly protest them if you can, obviously here in Canada you can, but like it's, it's, it's something that we should have these as targets for activity to encourage them to not do this sort of thing to encourage them to not be extorting assholes and to be targeting people for what they see and what they do with their computers and the privacy of their own homes so yeah the, that that particular list find out if if there's a tv show or a movie that has been made by one of these companies don't watch it encourage your friends not to watch it. encourage your friends to seek other media in your in their lives not because they're going to get caught if they download it not because it's wrong or something to, to, to see the media that they create, but because to witness and to participate in their cultural activities is to empower them to be to be a, a, a willing consumer of their media is to give them credit for creating that media. If they want to get to this point where they're going to use lawfare to target 
Canadian citizens and to make people afraid of using technologies like BitTorrent for creating and distributing media, then so be it. That's their grave that they should be digging by doing so, because the, the public should be aware that one, this is happening, and two, that this is just something that they're doing, and three, we don't have to put up with it. We can just cut them right out of the, the entire fabric of Canadian culture. There is precedent for encouraging people to to change the way that they participate in culture. I mean, we have, at the, the, I think it's at the, at the CRTC level, a requirement for Canadian content. Sure, that's done by the government, but are you, you have, do you have a percentage of your life that is not created by media companies that are suing people for the crime of using a computer and witnessing it and participating in culture? Is, it, it, is there a percentage of the, the media in your school uh, that is not produced by companies like this? These are the kinds of questions we should be asking ourselves right now, uh, is can we live without them? Can we, can we just cut them right out of our life entirely? Can we make it so that not only are they irrelevant, uh, but they're completely uh, cut off? And if you find one of the people who works for these companies, don't hire them. Don't talk to them. You can debate them, right? But on some level, there has to be a social cost for uh, engaging in this kind of really malicious targeting of innocent people. So that, that's kind of enough about that particular case. But let, let's make it expensive for them. Let, let's find, find where where they are and make it as expensive as possible to conduct this kind of campaign. Let's do it. Uh, so that that was one of the other things going on. So the next story is from Zero Hedge. Uh, this one's from uh, the seventh quote, China's big brother control or social control arrives in Australia. This one is authored by one Joshua Phillip and by the Epoch Times, which if you can get the Epoch Times, I find it's kind of an interesting read. It, it's kind of like a anti-Chinese propaganda newspaper sometimes. It's, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, but anyway, so continuing on. Australia is preparing to deb debut its version of chi the Chinese regime's high-tech system for monitoring and controlling its citizens. The, the launch will, to take place in the northern city of Darwin will include systems to monitor its people's activities by their cell phones. The new system is based on monitoring programs in Shenzhen, where the Chinese Communist Party is testing its social credit system. Officials on the Darwin Council have traveled to Shenzhen, according to NT News, to have a chance to see exactly how their smart technology works prior to it being fully rolled out. So a couple things here. One, of course, Shenzhen being like the tech capital of the world. Uh, if it's happening there, it's probably going to spread. That, that's kind of a scary thing that that's their kind of test bed. Two, this is what happens when we lose control of the technology in our life, and specifically cell phones, or what people consider to be cell phones. They're really not phones. Most people don't barely use them as phones at all. They're general purpose computers that fit in the palm of your hand, but they also tend to run software that we do not control, that we have no control over, that is being given increasingly to uh, the hands of proprietary software developers, governments, intelligence agencies, and now the, this kind of social credit system. And so in Darwin, continuing on, they've already constructed poles fitted with speakers, cameras, and Wi-Fi, according to NT News, to monitor people their movements around the city, the websites they visit, visit, and what apps they use. The monitoring will be done mainly by AI, will, will alert authorities based on set triggers. So th this is this is already too far. Like this, and, and the worst part is, is, I've heard from the perspective of city developers that they want stuff like this, that they consider stuff like that to be part of the more general idea of a smart city and that surveilling and monitoring citizens is something that should be done here in Thunder Bay specifically, but also in cities all across Canada, all across the world. Uh, and that the idea that the, to have a city that is smart and that can monitor their citizens on that level is in any way, shape or form desirable. It, it, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Uh, this is right up there with 1984, right? Like the, this is Big Brother, right? right implemented in technology happening in Australia. But why Why is it important to bring this up? Because in the past couple of weeks, we've talked about the, 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 the war on the ability of Australians specifically to understand and control the technology in their lives. I uh, had the AA bill, the bill that uh, made it basically a requirement that if the government comes to you and says, you are going to implement this functionality to spy on people, that you have to do it, uh, that makes the use of hard crypto basically illegal. And so this is the consequence. The consequence is 
then the technology in your life, the phone, the, the wristwatch, your, your bike, your car, your house, your thermostat, your, your laptop, everything around you starts to spy on you. And it starts to feed into these centralized systems that then monitor currently only based on triggers. Uh, but as the intelligence improves, it's going to monitor based on more and more subtle uh, activity. Uh, so what kind of triggers could they have? Could it be something like reading the Bible? Could it be uh, something like rereading something over and over again on your computer screen? If it's a book, uh, have we gotten to the point where all, most of the reading we do of books is done on a computer screen and that can be monitored? Like it's, 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 it's the, the ad options are kind of endless for them to just sort of pick up their political opponents off one by one and make it so that if you aren't following the, 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 the dogma of that particular, the, the group that's in power, that you don't have any access to the, the kind of necessary things to, to survive. And that's what we're already seeing in China. China's already started to lock people out of their airplanes and their trains and to keep them stuck in their local communities if they don't, uh, if they basically aren't popular enough, if they don't have the, the social credit number of being as pro Communist Party of China and their ideology as they can. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's, this is definitely going to happen. So from just as in China, the surveillance system is being branded as part of their smart city program. While Australian officials claim that its operations are been in, they've announced it functions to monitor cell phone activity and virtual fences will trigger, or trigger alerts if people cross them. So in other words, if you're the type of person who lives in a area, uh, like let's say a slum for you know, whatever minority group, and you leave that minority group, your phone will rat on you. Th this is how far it's already gotten. It's, it's gotten this far in Australia. It is gonna come here if it's allowed to pass there just as the, the crypto law that has been passed in Australia will come here. We're part of the five eyes. If Australia is capable of, of doing this and being pressured to do this from China, we'll get the same pressure. It's just a matter of time. So we'll get in a, a, a or quote, we'll be getting an alarm saying, quote, there's a person in this area if you put a virtual fence around. Boom, an alert goes out to whatever authority, whether it's the US or, or us or the police to go look at camera five said Josh Sattler, Darwin's council manager for innovation, growth and development services, according to the NT News, which is actually another important point because a lot of the time when they, they build these uh, smart city programs and they build these, uh, these surveillance systems, the language that they're using to describe what they are is one of innovation, growth and development because from their perspective, they're growing and they're creating these programs that, that uh, do new things. So it, it is a quote innovation. Now, in the past week, the Ford government here in Ontario just cut a significant amount of the budget for, quote, innovation uh, systems and the, the, the kind of startup funds and seed capital for innovation companies. And I can see already a lot of people are going to be freaking out about this. But I think there is that little bit of a, a silver lining in that a lot of what these companies were doing, especially the ones involved in unethical and proprietary software development, uh, where they were rolling out this kind of mass surveillance equipment to people. They're rolling out apps that can be used for mass surveillance. This is, at least in this context, uh, possibly slowed down a little bit here in Ontario. It might be a blessing in disguise. Anyway, quote, the nature of virtual fences and what type of activity will sound an alarm it isn't or still isn't being made clear, unquote kind of another point and that goes back to like the 2600 magazine and off the hook uh, have decades of examples of uh, filter systems that have been set up to catch originally stuff like uh, extreme child pornography that sort of thing but over time they get more and more and more sensitive and you get more and more and more people trapped in it and you get stuff like for example 2600 magazine if you read 2600 in australia will that trigger an alarm if you click on one of the links uh, from uh, Australia or from uh, something that, that contains a web page that links to 2600, will that be enough? These are the kinds of things that we're already seeing happen in other areas and we have every reason to expect will happen in this kind of a, a setup. So anyway, continuing on. The CCP smart city social credit system is able to monitor each person in the society tracking every element of their lives, including their friends, online purchases, daily behavior, and other information, 
and assigns each, each person a citizen score that determines their level of freedom in society. The, the tool is part, a core piece of the CCP programs to monitor and persecute dissidents, including religious believers and people who oppose the ruling communist system. Chinese human rights lawyer Tang Biao, a uh, visiting scholar at New York University, described the so social credit system as a new form of tyranny meant to reactivate the CCP's totalitarian hold on society. And they kind of go on and go on. But anyway, so it's exploring the system and it's called Chinese model or China model of totalitarian government as a service of, or as a service of its one belt, one road program, which is basically going to be a, a network of trade and technology ranging from Beijing going across the Bering Strait from through Russia to the, the States and Canada on one side and then going on the, the classic route of the Silk Road on the other, all the way to uh, f through the Middle East and through to Europe and then through to England. And so this is gonna be kind of a global network of communication and trade. Uh, and if they're tying this kind of surveillance into it, that is a very interesting thing. Uh, and if Australia goes for it, uh, that will encourage other governments around the world to, to also go for it. Now, in the case of Australia, they just had an election, they decided uh, as a country to basically have more of the same a uh, status quo the the changes in the number of seats were very small it, though i think the labor part uh, coalition lost a, a couple of votes or something uh or a couple of seats it, it was a very small change from at least an outsider's perspective well it, from the australian perspective it looked like kind of a big deal and that there was a, a, a lot of drama going on as part of this election but from an outsider's perspective, nothing really changed. Uh, it's not even like the level of change from like George Bush going to Obama, you know, the, the two political parties that don't really uh, differ in all that much meaningful uh, of a level. At least there are differences there, right? When only a, a seat or two changes after a general election, after we, we've seen stuff like the concentration camps, uh, the loss of the ability to use hard crypto, the mandatory backdoors in systems and now this this mandatory chinese social credit uh, surveillance totalitarian system like what are people in australia uh, not doing like the, the, they, they seem to be not freaking out about this at all otherwise we would have seen a different result in the election so more of this is going to come in australia certainly but if it if it can happen in australia and if a election can can kind of verify that the people are okay with it there, definitely expected to spread elsewhere, uh, expected to come to at least one of the other five uh, com or countries, which could very well be here next. So anyway, that, that's that's enough scary stuff uh, going on in the world. I don't have something to, to kind of finish off the episode today. Uh, if you have any Creative Commons music that you would like me to play, please send it to me via Ricochet or any other means that you can communicate with me. Uh, I will give it a listen and then maybe play it. And if you have something that you'd like me to talk talk about or mention, uh, or something to kind of add uh, to anything I said today, definitely bring it up. And as usual, if you want more of this and more uh, in-depth stuff, uh, I can go deeper into particular topics if there is need for it or desire for it. Um, send me something on Subscriber Star, Villages, or Bitcoin. Uh, subscriber star is probably the best for this particular show, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see as time goes by if anyone actually does. So as usual, I will see you next week and thank you for watching.